Hello, this is Nick Et Etlinger with Analytics from Scratch, learning from your learners. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? All right, um, so my name is Nick Etlinger. I'm with edX, uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, Analytics from Scratch. Uh, we're gonna show you a few different uh, things that we've been thinking about at edX and, and looking into, and they're, uh, they're simple metrics and simple kind of calculations and analyses that you can do uh, on your own open edX instances and uh, hopefully also find interesting meaningful things out of. So who am I? Uh, I work at edX. I'm a data analyst there. Uh, I studied statistics and machine learning in, in college and uh, I'm passionate about learning just like you guys and uh, that's what I'm here to talk about. So what I hope you'll take away from this session is a few things. Um, I want to explain to you how I like to think about answering a problem using data and using an analytical mindset to do that. We're going to give you some useful analytics that you can run at home on your own open edX instance. And there will be code, take home code uh, snippets which are posted on a GitHub. And those you can also run at home and uh, find insights out of, hopefully. So in particular, there are three areas that I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about course quality. Uh, we can find out who's a successful learner. Um, we can find out what are engaging and successful courses, and maybe some courses that could use some work and can use some analysis to figure out how to make them better and more useful for our learners. The second piece is uh, learner activity. And we're going to think about who's an active learner, who's not an active learner, who's recently been around and who's not. And then we can look at, you know, on a course level, which courses are engaging for, and, and have a lot of users learning right now, and which ones don't have a lot of learners uh, hanging out at the time. And then the third area is course recommendations. And so I will show you how to recommend a new course for a learner and how to uh, look at one course and find out what other courses might be similar to that course. So I want to start by talking about a framework I like to use for answering a question or uh, answering a business problem you have and using data to back up your analyses. So formally, it's called CRISP DM, but today I'm going to give you a simplified version of this. We talk about business understanding, and so that's getting the business problem right, figuring out what the question you need to answer is. Maybe in our case, it's which courses are learners finishing and which courses aren't learners finishing. Um, so it's super important to know what you want to ask and understand the business problem before you can really dive into the data. It's very easy once you have data to just want to dive into it, but it's really important to take a step back first and to learn um, what you're going to do with it. So the second step, of course, is once you know what you want to ask and what you want to find is to find the data that is relevant to your problem and to understand that data. And then you've got the data, get the meat out of it, get the juicy part. Um, that's the data preparation. That's step three. And then finally, you have some findings. You've analyzed the data. You've got it at like, the level that you need it. Um, there's follow-up and next steps in terms of what you want to get out of that data and uh, what else could you do with it. How can you learn from what you found? So our first example relates to course quality. So the business understanding here is you have a lot of courses and you want to know who's finishing them, who's not finishing them, which courses might be engaging and not. So if you know that a course is going to have a high completion rate, then we know uh, this is a good course. People like this. Let's spread the word. Let's tell people about it. Let's get people into this course because people who take this course are successful. Um, and the same thing goes that maybe we can look at why is this course so good? What are people getting out of it? Why do they want to finish it? And conversely, there's courses that have a low completion rate. And those courses, we may say, OK, we need some work here. Um, maybe it's too long. We should break it up into a few sub-courses, a few different pieces, just because it's covering just a, a very large amount of material. The other piece that you could do with that is uh, the difficulty. Maybe it was not quite the right level for your audience, and so we want to make some tweaks there. And then lastly, learners could be stuck at a certain spot along the course. Maybe they have to go to an external website to fill out a poll or do an assignment, 
and that's broken, and that gets people stuck so they can't finish the course. So that's sort of the business understanding of course quality and what the problem means. And so now that we, we know course quality and we understand like this business, uh, this completion rate, let's figure out how to find it with our open edX data. So how do we know if someone has completed a course? And in this context, we're actually talking about passing a course. So we know who started a course from this student course enrollment table, which is uh, part of your, your LMS. It's a, it's a MySQL database. And then the second piece of this is the who's passed a course and who hasn't. And so you can figure out who's passed a course from this grades persistent course grade table. And I give you the exact names here so that when you're back home later and you want to look at this data, you know where, exactly where to go. So now that we, we know where to look, let's get what we need out of this. So we figure out a completion status from if they have that past timestamp so that they passed it at some point or other, we know they've completed it. So we take the enrollments and you just do you know, a left join against who has completed it. And now we have a per user in a course, you know, an enrollment record of, OK, this person has not finished the course. This person has finished the course. And so now we know for each of our learners. And so if we were going to email folks who haven't passed the course, we could you know, grab them from this table. Maybe we want to congratulate people who have passed the course. We can also grab those records out of this query and, uh, and let them know. So now you know on a per user, per, per enrollment basis, you know who's completed, who hasn't. Um, but let's summarize that at a course level, because at a course level, then we can know what's a good course and what's maybe not so good course by the overall completion rate. So we aggregate it here. You don't, 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 don't need to look at the code. You can look at the code in your own time when you have space, but I put it up here for reference. Um, and so here we have the course completion rate. And so this is, OK, this is my course, the demo at X course. I had four enrollments for users who wanted to take the course. And uh, nobody's passed it yet. But um, hopefully someone will soon. So that's how we get the completion rate. Um, what do we do with that? What do we think about that? There's a few things we can take away. Now, just because a course has a low completion rate doesn't really mean that um, it's a bad course, per se. And conversely, just because it has a high completion rate doesn't mean it's a great course. It might just be really short. It's really important to look at a course level and, and look at the content and say, OK, what do I think about this course? How could I make it better? Why is it already good? And one thing that we found uh, at edX is uh, a typical course that we host has somewhere between a 1% and a 5% completion rate. Now, as we know, the barrier to entry to starting a course is super low. So you know, it's not a huge rate of completion. But you know, depending on the course, if it's at the 5% or higher, we know that it's, a, it's an engaging course. And if it's at the 1% or lower, we generally can get a good sense that this course might need some work to make it more valuable for our learners. And of course, there are some adjustments you can make to these metrics if you're interested uh, and you have some more nuances that you want to capture. Again, depends on your context. So that's, that's completion rates. The next piece that I want to show you guys is looking at your active learners and finding out who's an active learner. All right, so the way we're going to define an active learner is uh, by looking at the student, uh, the courseware student module table. And so this table um, has a record every time a student is in a course and is looking at a section of course content. And so each, each record here is what's called a block. And a block is a, is a small section of course content. And the important piece for us is that Every time a learner pulls up a new page and is, is learning, the block gets modified. And so we can use this modified time as a proxy for when the last time this learner was engaged with the course. And so we, we look at the most recent modified and we say, OK, this is the last time that Joe was taking this course and uh, learning this content. So putting that into a query, we get um, just you know, for each 
enrollment, we get the most recent uh, modified time, and that's the last time uh, student nine was active. So that's, we see student nine was last taking content on May 24th. And um, we know that, okay, he was active last week and he was active last month because, you know, May 24th was recently. So that's on a per student level how we would get activity. Um, and again, this is useful because we can figure out, okay, I have all these 27 learners who showed up last week. Let me send them an email and say, like, good to see you. Like, let me know if you have any questions. And conversely, maybe you want to reach out to the folks who were not active last week and remind them to come back to the course and uh, let them know you're available if they have any questions or, or need help. And so, again, this per user level is also super valuable. Um, we get folks at edX a lot of times who want to reach out, partners and, and marketing team, and say, I want people who were active last week, or I want people who weren't active last week, because I want to remind them, and I want them to come back and keep learning this great content. So, you know, we find this kind of a level is super useful. And then, of course, you can summarize it per course. And you can say, my demo course has one learner, and that learner was recently active. And so that's also useful. You want to compare different courses. And you can see how much activity is in different courses. Maybe you just announced a new course, and you want to see, OK, I have a lot of enrollments, but do I have a lot of learning happening? And so you can look at the recently active learners and see how many there are. Because it's one thing to sign up. It's another thing to show up and start taking the content and be active this week, right now. So, so what? Um, it's good to know who's active, who's learning, and who's not. Um, super important to be engaged with your community. And uh, this is a great way to figure out who is and who isn't engaged. There's a few possible extensions. I'll let you read those in your spare time. Um, but the next piece that I want to talk about is course recommendations. Um, now, you probably have all shopped on Amazon. And you know that there's, like, there's banners. So let's say you're shopping for a nice new cat hoodie. And you'll see the banner of uh, customers who viewed this also viewed. Well, we can think about course recommendations in much the same way. We can think about learners who took this course also took these other courses. And since everyone has enrollments on their Open edX instance, anyone is going to be able to use this method and figure out uh, course recommendations for each person. You can figure out recommendations for someone who hasn't taken any courses yet. You can, you know, if they're looking at one page, you can say, okay, here's some uh, other courses that are like this. So this is something that I think most folks will be find pretty, pretty interesting. I know I'm always looking for like a, a new exciting course to check out, so I find it helpful. So the way, if you think about how our data works and how we're going to get to this place, it's good to remember how our data is structured. And so what we have is we have a set of courses and a set of learners. And learners can sign up for any, any, any set of courses they want. But learners can't enroll in other learners, and courses can't enroll in other courses. So you have this link between learners and courses. Um, and so what we're going to do is, uh, if you think about it, learner one is taking course A and B. And so if another learner comes in and takes course A, we're probably going to suggest course B, because learner one took both of those courses. And so the way we're going to recommend it's going to work a lot like that. Basically, what we can do is we can uh, make a, for every course, we can collapse it. So for, see the five there? That means that there are five learners who took a science class and a stats class. And so we, we put these together. And so now we know, OK, one person took math and science. Four people took math and statistics. And so this is what's called a co-enrollment matrix. And the co-enrollment matrix lets us understand um, how, many, how many bridges there are between every set of courses. So the way we would use this to make a recommendation is we would say, OK, you took a stats class. What did you take next? Well, if we look at that stats column or that stats row, it's a, it's a symmetrical matrix. You can see that the largest number in this stats column is the 5. And that 5 is in the science row. And so we say, OK, because you like stats, the most popular course for stats students to also take is this science course. And so that's why we'd recommend the science course. And so 
I'll show you how to get that out of the data now. Basically, we make this matrix by taking a, a grid of all these students and all the enrollments, and then you take the cross product of that, and that collapses it down to have one row per course and one column per course, and then the number corresponding to each course column pair is the number of students who took that course and this course. And so that's, that's the matrix that underlies this. To use that, we just need to do lookups in this matrix. So, you know, runtime, it's actually super instant and super quick once we've calculated this matrix. And um, I was able to do it on my, you know, 40 million enrollments on my computer. So you guys can even run it on your own local machine, which is pretty exciting because some of these other machine learning algorithms really don't run on a single machine. Um, so you have that matrix which has the number of you know, pairs between every set of courses and how popular every course pairing is. Now we want to use that to make a recommendation given a specific course or a set of courses that you took and you liked. So what we do that is there are two ways. We can do what I call the unweighted recommendation, um, which prefers the most popular course. And so that says, OK, here's all the courses, and here's how many courses other people took with your course and we look for the most popular one among those. Now this one prefers courses like Harvard CS50 or MIT 601 because those courses have so many total enrollments that they have a lot of just gross co-enrollments with other courses. Um, so the second way is to account for popularity and to adjust for courses that are super popular is what I call the weighted. And so this takes those suggestions we were going to make and adjust them by how popular each course was, meaning how many enrollments it had total. And so this will give you kind of more interesting and more niche recommendations that aren't just the most popular course you see out there. And we found, I found in our data that this still gives you relevant recommendations, but can be a little more interesting. So that's how we get what we need out of the data. So why is this useful, and, uh, and what do we do with this? Well, it's a pretty simple framework. You already have all the data you need. You just need the course enrollments. It's in everyone's Open edX instance. Um, the code is right here for you to use. If you have any questions, um, I'll be posting the GitHub link in a minute, and you can message me on GitHub, uh, and I'm happy to help show folks how to use that. What I just showed above is our code. Um, if you guys are Python people, send me a message, let me know. I'm happy to get you guys the Python code, too, because I want you guys to be able to make this work and use this on your own. Um, so I have here an example that I ran on our edX data. Let's say you took these two courses, English Grammar and Style and Foundations of Data Analysis. What else would I recommend? Well, uh, the two suggestions here that are the two most popular are Principles of Written English and uh, uh, doing business in Asia, speaking English. So that's, that's an example of how the recommendations might look and work. Um, the cool thing about this framework is you can have a learner with only one enrollment, you can have a learner with 100 enrollments, and you can use either one of those to like make suggestions, and you can make one suggestion, or you can make 20 suggestions. Um, so that's, that's what I like about it, that it has that flexibility. Um, there's a lot of ways you can use these recommendations, too. You can uh, maybe send an email campaign out to say, I know you've taken these. What else would you like to take? Um, here's, some, here's some suggestions for that. You could make a little quiz on a, on a page, and you could use this data behind the scenes to power your quiz and, uh, and make recommendations. Or you could uh, add a little, like just like Amazon, uh, you might also be interested in section you know, using the same backbone. So, uh, so that's how the course recommendations work. Um, what I want to do next is I want to talk to you guys a little bit and get some community participation. I have a prompt for you. Um, so this is what we're interested in, what we've been talking about at edX. I want to know what are you doing with your data and what kinds of questions are you guys trying to answer? Do I have anyone who wants to tell me about something they're working on? Hi. One sec. So uh, we run gymnasium.com. It's essentially mm -hmm. a code school run on OpenEdX. 
Um, one of the things that, w so we, we track a lot of the data that comes through that's relevant to our model, which is maybe not as traditional as some of the, the other um, university type things that come through edX, but one of the things that we're interested in is um, how and when people finish courses and pass final exams uh, for certifications because our business model, sort of our students become most important to us after they complete a course. Mm -hmm. uh, and so figuring out when they finish the course and then starting to engage with them then is something that's important to us. Uh, and trying to do that on a more real-time basis is, is valuable to us, too. Nice, nice. Other, other folks? Yeah, go ahead. One so sec. I think, uh, like the, the mic's coming over. Okay. So um, we're developing uh, figures, which is a uh, lightweight uh, app, uh, reporting analytics app to plug in the LMS. Okay. And so I'm working on filling in data in the back end. Mm -hmm. So for me, and basically it's kind of the same questions as you know, getting a better view in on you know, the activity, the, you know, the topics that you covered. And so seeing what you did was validating, you know, through the data <laughs> that I went through. Okay, um, good. So it's just, it's really, it's like we're on the, it seems to be that, you know, and from people I've talked with, that we're all on the same page in, in the kinds of questions that we need answered. Good, good, awesome. Um, so one, one of the, um, of the things is that there is some types of content, right? Mm -hmm. This is like gamification or video or text, and the people, uh, the people, um, there is some people that would rather prefer one over over other, right? Yeah. Uh, so it is some kind of chance that that you can like do like a, a survey first and try to identify this kind of people with this kind of background, uh -huh. prefer this kind of content, so in the future you can have like, uh, okay, I know what's, what this guy wants, for the, not only for the survey, but also for the behavior that he has been having uh, along the, the, the courses. So he, maybe, maybe he, 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 the videos, he jumps video to video, but when, it, when it's a game, he's staying there. So uh, how, how can I personalize uh, for, for the same uh, subject, different types of content for, 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 for one person? Uh -huh. uh, like, it is, it is that possible today, or it's? That's a, that's a good question, actually. Um, it's too, there's a, one of our Ed Services leads, Ben Piscopo, is really good at that, and he, uh, he was just telling me earlier this week about there's some ways to do different groupings and to, to show different content to different groups, like A-B test content. And so I, I've heard that that's possible. Again, I'm not an expert in how Studio works, but uh, I like that idea, and uh, it's definitely an approach we think about is like how to customize learning experience. And, uh, and one of the things that we're talking about, too, is customizing like the discovery period ex experience, so helping people like personalize getting them to the right course because different learners, of course, have different course interests. So that's another question we like. That's good. Yeah? So to help, there is, um, uh, should be a recording of uh, adaptive learning um, in one of the earlier talks. So watching that may help you um, kind of shape a path in order to uh, uh, meet your needs with that. I want to uh, take a second now. Um, are there any other questions from the talk? Uh, something that I covered that maybe was a little confusing or someone would like some clarification on? If there's else. I, don't, I don't see another hand. Uh, So when I'm pulling in the grades data, I'm, I, I basically have empty persistent uh, grades. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the kind of questions I've got. I'm pulling in dynamically right now, and it takes a very long time. Okay. And so that's something that I want to figure out how to, you know, am I doing something wrong in configuration that uh -huh. I don't have, you know, the grades being populated in the persistent grades table? Hmm. That's a good question. We actually have some public documentation on the grades table in, uh, in our uh, Confluence page. I, I, can, I can give you the link after the talk, but uh, Namisha, who's the head of architecture at edX, did a lot of work in, in the, the data model for the grades, and so fortunately that's, you know, 
documentation is better and worse in different places and uh, you know there's actually really good documentation how the grades section works so if you're curious about how I figured out who, who's passed and who's not and if you have nuances like that that you want to clarify and I know most of us data scientists end up getting caught up on the nuances so it's, it's important for us to to check those boxes and follow those leads uh, I'm happy to just show anyone where to find that documentation on Confluence. Yeah, go ahead. I was wondering why why the like the mindset of uh, of that that mindset that that mindset that relates uh, quality of a course with completion rates because when when you have m like massive courses. Uh, maybe the courses are difficult, and, mm -hmm. and that's it. Like, uh, and you don't, we, you won't have the course could be very good, but you you won't have good completion rates because not everyone has the background or the ability or the discipline to do it. So uh, maybe you maybe uh, I don't know. Uh, my my question is, uh, the mind it is real. Like, is there a a real relationship between quality and completation that is that could be and how how you can see through the data if it is because it is difficult and naturally difficult mm -hmm. or it, it, or if it is because it has some uh, some mistakes on the uh, on the on the content so maybe some blank space yeah. between knowledge uh -huh. or something like that how you can really identify what is, the, what is the real problem with the computation mm -hmm. rates, right? That's a really excellent question, and that's one that we're actually are actively looking at and trying to answer. And if anyone else is working on that question, I'd, I'd love to chat with you later. Um, maybe at the Birds of the Feather talk tomorrow, or, or just send me a message on Slack. Um, there are a, a lot of different ways to think about course quality. Some of the simplest ones that we've been looking at is we have unenrollments, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, refunds and so we look for the refund rate of a course like if a lot of folks are asking for a refund then that's a red flag and the same thing goes if a lot of folks are unenrolling in a course that's one dimension of course the completion rate is another dimension again you're very right that that affects is affected by the difficulty and some courses are just going to be difficult that's the nature of the content uh, what a slice that I've done that I found kind of interesting is you can look at the completion rate for each education level I know on our edX instance we ask about what's your what's your educational background? Do you have a formal education, an associate's degree, a master's degree? So I've put some data together on like what's the completion rate of high school students, what's the completion rate of master's students, and what's the completion rate of bachelor students? And you can see an interesting trend where there's a number of courses with a high completion rate for high school students, but a lower completion rate for masters and bachelor students. And those we'll see are courses like um, uh, Arizona State University has some like introductory English courses. So we we found a slice of our content that is actually probably not needed for someone who's a bachelor's or higher, so they don't finish that course. So that like you know completion rate per education level has been really useful in understanding like what's the minimum education needed to be successful in this course. And so we'd assume like if you if you have a certain master's completion rate. A master's student probably has the background needed to take this course, and if it falls off at a lower education level, then it's a reasonable inference that maybe it's just not bachelor students aren't ready for it, and maybe high school students aren't ready for this content. So that's one way we're able to kind of understand the difference between difficulty and um, educational level, because obviously not all learners are prepared for all content. Any another question here? One sec. and all the side from Microsoft. Uh -huh. uh, just a suggestion, uh, the data are great. The one thing that lessons that we learned by leveraging the data was the use of the dashboard itself and the data mm -hmm. that comes across. A lot of the students will basically sign up for a ton of courses and it stays on the dashboard and the only way to clean up the dashboard is to unenroll. Yeah. And if you're not familiar with how unenrollment works, that's something that you, know, you learn over experience. One, one would be an ask to say if, if that's something you could look into yeah. and ensure that hey, either you do pagination for the number of courses or the number of courses 
recently that they've interacted with. Otherwise, those courses stay on the learner's dashboard. And the only way to clean those off, the, mm -hmm. like I said myself, is people aren't enrolled. So your 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 uh, so we get mixed reasoning signals is on the data. if they leave it on their dashboard, they probably are interested in the course. Correct. That makes sense. Yeah. And then they unenroll. It sends a wrong signal to if you're analyzing the data. You learn over time, but I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. It's a good point. Thank you. Do we have any other any other questions or comments? All right, we got time for one more. Thank you. Do you have a plan of adding any of this to like insights and um, products that you have mm -hmm. on the platform um, already, in open edX especially? That's, that's a good question. Uh, we're actively looking at ways to um, improve the discovery process using things like course recommendations and better guidance in terms of how to find the right course for you. Um, we're still like early in that process and at some point, well, you know, once we get the the code base done for that, then then we can make it part of the open edX. So my hope is that we get much better at this course discovery process. And of course, that should be able to extend to all of your open edX instances too. So it's certainly our intention to make it a lot easier to discover courses. They may not exactly use this course discovery algorithm, but um, definitely recommendations are something that people are talking about. That's a good, good question. All right, uh, I, think, I think we're at time. So uh, thank you all, uh, and I hope you have a good afternoon. Sleeping in my bed. Now, baby, you're messing with my head. I 
I told you to go to win my heart. As if we lay here in the dark. You shouldn't be sleeping in my bed Now baby you're messing with my head I told you before don't break my heart I said as we lay here in the dark You shouldn't be sleeping in my bed Now baby you're messing with my head I told you before don't break my heart I said as we lay here in the dark
talking about this pilot. Okay, thank you. Hello, you will hear me? Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Michel Plantier. I will present me in a few minutes. Uh, I will present a tool we have, we have designed to uh, graphically represent uh, grade data from uh, edX. Um, so this, uh, pa this tool has been designed as part of a French national research program um, named FLIRT, who, who is uh, dedicated to innovation and to improve teaching efficiency in MOOCs. Uh, this tool has been uh, designed and directed first by the Professor Michel Cramp, which is retired, and retired now. And my name is Michel Plantier. I, have, uh, I am an assistant professor in a, a French engineer school or university called EMT Minales. And I am part of uh, LGE de P Research Laboratory, which is de dedicated to the uh, decision and uh, decision-making process and computer science. Uh, our tool is uh, already used by more than 50 MOOCs right now on edX and FUN, which is the French uh, uh, implementation of edX. edX. So the, 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 the goals of MOOC pilot is that uh, uh, teachers have some difficulties to follow up their learners in a MOOC, especially when there are more than 10,000 10, learners, what to do, how to handle so, uh, such a great number of grades, how to um, visualize grades, and how to visualize learner progress. So it's a part of uh, the data deluge we, we know. Um, so there are, uh, uh, right now, in edX insights, there are some tools we can use to follow up learners. For example, enrollment, locations, performance, grades, engagement, interaction, video, etc. And uh, what provides uh, in more, uh, MOOC pilot provides in, uh, in addition is uh, a global uh, grade progression over time, over the, the whole course. Like, so time progression and uh, forum monitoring also, we will see that. And uh, also we are able to follow up learners which are members of a cohort. So uh, pilot has, uh, is presented like this. There is a front end with nine different tools. Uh, so it's a, pre, a visual presentation. We, uh, it's uh, the, the way the, the goal is to facilitate uh, the learners monitoring by teachers and by the teaching team, and uh, before, during, and after the MOOC session. So the first uh, thing we have to do is to uh, have uh, some back end management that is to um, uh, adapt and to, to plug in uh, our uh, uh, MOOC pilot tool to the, the course, to the MOOC course, so that we, have, uh, we can and then access to uh, all, the, all the grade reports which are present in edX. And so this is to manage which grade report we want to show up on the, on the screen. So it's fully compatible with any open edX platform. So the first start is not so different than edX uh, presenting. There is um, uh, the number of enrollment per period. There are two, two uh, different uh, kind of learners, participants and non-participants, which, uh, which shows if learners uh, who enrolled a long time before are, uh, are able to likely not to, to start the scores. Uh, so the, the second uh, representation is this one, which is uh, quite new, is to see if there are uh, exit points. That is where uh, 
the learners are stuck during the course. So the columns are representing what we call the, um, the, the period, the each uh, collection of note of uh, grades. Uh, usually uh, grades are collected each week. It's a recommendation we, we, say, we told the, the teachers. And um, um, for each week, we, we see where are stuck each learner. So uh, a bubble contains all the learners who completed their last exercise. Each learner is only presented in one bubble. So we can see if there are some kind of problem during the course. Either, the, for example, the, the, the exercise uh, homework number three is too difficult, and the persons, the learners, are not able to come out of this uh, exercise, or in, for any other reasons, the, the learners didn't uh, uh, follow up the other exercises. So uh, we, with this graph, we can track difficulties in the course. Uh, another representation which is quite similar, but uh, a little bit different, is group progression. In this uh, uh, chart, we see uh, where each learn which exercise have followed each learner. And uh, so in this, uh, uh, chart, each learner is present in each bubble where he has completed the exercise, so he may be present in different, in uh, several bubbles. And when we click on the bubble, we um, can access to the list of the learner of this bubble. For, for example, the squared uh, bubble here uh, is represented on the right side with all the list of the learners. And with this list, we can access to the, the chart of each uh, learner and see if he's going well or not during the course. So, uh, and there is another benefit, is that uh, we can send in information specifically to a group of learners which, which are present in one bubble. And, uh, Another uh, representation, which is al almost the same, but specifically uh, adapted for a cohort. Where, as you know, we can define cohorts in, um, in edX. And uh, for each cohort, we can see where are stuck all uh, the learners or what are the progression of each learner. So this is uh, very interesting, ex especially for uh, SPOC courses uh, in, 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 uh, in companies. And uh, uh, so I, I told uh, uh, you uh, a few minutes ago about uh, individual learner monitoring. We can see for each learner where and what his, uh, his results for each exercise and we present the information with, a small, with smileys. Uh, if, of course, if the smiley is, uh, is, uh, is uh, blue with a, a, big <laughs> a big sign like this, then um, the, the person has uh, completed the course, co the, the exercise uh, completely. And we can see with different colors and different smileys if the person is going well or not. There are another, another way of representing information is uh, with bar graphs. There are four different bar graphs. Uh, I will uh, present one of them because some of them are a little bit similar to edX. So uh, this one is a particular one where we see the group progression, the general progression in the course. So it's, it's a little, it, little bit tricky to in, interpret, but uh, uh, we see that in that chart that if each person uh, has followed an exercise in, a one, in one specific week, and if, um, 
if there is some persons who are late, we can track them uh, during the, uh, with the, this chart. And another uh, representation is the forum. Usually, uh, uh, regard, uh, have, having a look to the forum in edX is a quite compli complicated task. We, we cannot uh, track each individual uh, very easily. And so we have designed a, a specific tool to represent the forum in, in different ways. So uh, there are two colors, po uh, the persons who have, who have uh, sent posts on the forum and uh, green, which are the answers to this post. And there are a lot of uh, a different kind of messages. So the, on the right left, on the, uh, on the left, sorry, left uh, middle, we see here the commented messages. And on the bottom left, we, we see the um, often messages. And there is a, a, a specific chart here where we can uh, uh, have the commented and often messages. So I will, will show you in a demo in a few minutes. So, for example, if I click on a, a specific person, uh, this on the upper left here, we see the uh, senders of the messages, and they are uh, listed by uh, the number of messages they have sent. We can see in a, re in a graphic representation all the messages he have sent. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, and uh, uh, so, and when we uh, want to see w uh, a, a specific message for, for a person, then we, we can click on the message on the right side here, with the, where we see the title, the, the message is listed here, and we have the answer on the bottom right, where we can see the answers to this message, etc. And uh, so this is the, the forum representation. And uh, this uh, tool is helpful to have a follow-up on the forum and see if persons are uh, following the course correctly, etc. If there is a, a, uh, enough activity in, in the, the course, etc. So MOOC pilot is, by, is a, a separate pilot, uh, a, a, sorry, a separate tool from edX for the, uh, up to now. Uh, it's based on uh, D3 JavaScript library, which is a graphic library. Uh, it's a client-server arch architecture with uh, JavaScript and HTML on the client side. And uh, on the server side, there is Java and JavaScript. Uh, server architecture is uh, Linux and Tomcat set. And uh, there is no database. We have only the grade reports from edX. So it's simply to install. If you just have to, uh, to possess a server somewhere and uh, install it uh, if you have uh, Linux on it. Um, it's all, all, also it's an open source version. I will uh, speak of that in a few minutes. Uh, so we are designing a new interface more in accord with our uh, graphic chart in uh, Institut Min Telecom. And this is the same graphics with the same, uh, different colors. Here is another graphic with the same different colors. And the, the dashboard, uh, the front-end dashboard is a little bit uh, um, different. So uh, MOOC Pilot is an efficient tool to help track learners. Uh, it's, it was a demand from uh, a lot of teachers who had uh, uh, difficulties to follow up the learners. There are nine ways, ways of tracking uh, learners. It's um, we, we try to simplify a uh, complex data uh, set by visualizing visualization, uh, simple visualization. It's only based on grade reports. 
So there is much more to do, of course, because uh, we can first use uh, the learner logs, which, which, which is, uh, has been uh, um, uh, speaked out uh, in different uh, lectures before. Um, we can visualize also activity video watching. Up to now, we didn't do that because we have, uh, in our version of edX, we didn't have real-time uh, access to this information. And uh, it may become a strategic tool for our executive because uh, we can have a, a MOOC report at the end, which is uh, generated directly from the data we have. And uh, also, it may, uh, we may uh, give uh, SPOC specificities because uh, in, in companies, for example, they need to know if the, the employees have follow up the courses, if they uh, succeeded on the course, etc. So we may have specific reports, and this is more, uh, more to do. It's not done uh, already. Uh, MOOC Pilot is uh, open usage. You can, uh, uh, you can uh, download it on, open, uh, on GitHub. It's open source. It's, re it's, it's based on license agreement, Cecil. And uh, um, why not uh, speak about integration in edX some, some days? We, we are open to that, of course. Um, so uh, I will make a small demo, if you want. Uh, so if you want to have more information on Pilot, then we, we can, you can, uh, uh, ask one of, on our, one of the, these persons. Uh, for example, Laurent David is uh, uh, doing administration on MOOC Pilot. If you want to have installed uh, a version of MOOC Pilot for your MOOC, then just ask him, and it's done in a minute. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let me see. So I, I will make a demo. So here we have uh, uh, a specific course uh, which was on uh, network uh, theory. And so here we have the nine tools. The first one is uh, this one, where we see uh, accumulated progression. Each person is present in different bubbles. And uh, so in this bubble, for example, we can click here and have uh, the list of uh, the persons of uh, this, uh, uh, the, this bubble. Uh, here we have unknown because we haven't in France the right to get information to the email of students. But in edX, we have this information. Uh, it's also available in fun in uh, the French uh, version, but we have not the right to use it. And so when we do that, we can then visualize a specific uh, student here, where we see his progression over time in uh, what, what he has done uh, during the, the, the different sessions. So, um, we can do, go to another uh, tool, uh, for example, uh, f um, exit points. So here is a different view, as, as I said. Each person, each student is only one, is present on only one bubble. And as, as, uh, as, as previously, we have the list of persons of this bubble. And then the, the last one is uh, so the uh, forum representation. So here we have the senders. Here we have the, the answers to the message. So for example, I click here. I have all the messages uh, graphically here on the center of this person. And on the right, all the messages uh, this person has sent. And the answers, the commentaries on this uh, uh, messages. We have here the 
uh, another person who commented uh, mostly on the messages. So we can click on one of his messages and see what, what is the message and what are the answers to the message, etc. So there is some uh, enhancement to do to, uh, to, to have on this uh, graphic uh, representation of the forum because it may, be, it may become a little bit complicated, but it, uh, it's already very useful because we can see who is writing what uh, to who. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, useful. And uh, the last one I didn't uh, represent it, uh, before is this. Uh, so it's in French, so I uh, apologize for that. It's a uh, commented message and often messages. So if the often messages are coming uh, up, that is, the, there is a lot of messages coming up and uh, no answer to them. So it's uh, uh, important to come back and uh, answer these messages. And we can, uh, of course, have other representations like this one to um, enhance the, the pi uh, uh, pil uh, monitoring of the, of the course. Okay. So thank you very much for uh, this, uh, for your attention. And if you have questions. I'm, I tried to reformulate your question. It's uh, uh, about the forum. Uh, so um, what I understand is that uh, um, you, want, you want to know if uh, it is uh, uh, a way to monitor what are the topic of discussions during the forum. Is that is that? that? Uh, maybe filtering out. Filtering out. Separate meaning, of, um, yes. Yeah. Mm. So we, we didn't do, do that. We didn't uh, analyze the meaning of the forum. It, uh, it's the next step, but uh, it's a huge step because <laughs> uh, analyzing the meaning, it's a text mining uh, procedure. Uh, it's not so easy. Uh, some some of, of you may, be, may say that it's easy, but uh, if you want to have the main topics and the main discussion about it, it's, we have to uh, just uh, be uh, 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 careful about what we want to show. Um, so it's anyway, it's the, the next step. Now, just we, we uh, the, 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 the demand from the teachers was uh, in the first time, what is going on on the forum? Because they go to edX and uh, they have uh, they are lost uh, somehow to in in the platform. Uh, it's not a critic of edX, but uh, it's um, we wanted to represent in the first time graphically this information on the forum. And uh, all of of course, the next step is to have uh, uh, artificial intelligence analysis about what is on the forum. So the main charts they are using of this, uh, this of this tool. Yeah. 
Is, is that your, your question? Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, so we have, uh, so I come back to the front end. So we have some, some, some um, feedback from the teachers. And uh, the, 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 there are two or three uh, our, our charts which are mainly used. The first one is the cumulated progression here. Uh, the second is a forum analysis, and the third one is general progression. So I will, I will show you uh, in a in few minutes. So this one, it's uh, to show exit points. So uh, with this chart, uh, teachers use it, use, use it for, uh, for, for seeing if there is some difficulty in the course. Uh, the next one is this one. Are the, the, the students going up slowly in the course, or is there some, some way that they are uh, not so quick on the course, not, not enough quick for the teachers? Uh, of course, this chart uh, uh, is mo mainly useful if uh, uh, students are following the beginning of the course and the end of the course. That is, if the, the, the course is uh, beginning on the 1st of March, we expect that the, the, the students are beginning the course uh, during the, the opening of the course. If the, the students are uh, following the course um, a long time after the beginning, it's not so useful. And of course, uh, the forum uh, viewing of the activity is another way to see if there are some problems in the course, because if there are some problems, uh, students post some, uh, some text and uh, ask for difficulties. Okay, thank you.